This is For Keeps With You Baxter Boys, Book 5 Written by Jesse Gussman Performed by J. Dice Episode 1 Chapters 1 through 4 Chapter 1 Dusty Gibson focused her eyes on the black number two before slamming the visor of her helmet down. The noise of the other competitors faded out, making her feel like she had entered an alternate reality. Her bike rumbled beneath her. The two changed to a one. She flicked her wrist, twisting the handle and pumping the gas. With her other hand, she squeezed the clutch, her bike trembled in eager anticipation. The one turned sideways. Two seconds later, the gate fell. Dusty dropped the clutch and twisted her wrist. Engines screamed around her. Grabbing the clutch, she jerked her foot, caught second, and sprang ahead. A guy in purple on her left edged closer. On her right, a yellow jersey and a red jersey fought for position. She jammed third, then fourth gear, keeping her eyes on the first jump. Ideal position would be the leader of the pack at that point. She hadn't gotten to be the points leader in motocross racing by running in the back. Running wide open, she angled to the left, toward Purple Shirt, who was running even with her. From her practice runs, she knew the direct middle of the jump had a slight dip that hit the wrong way would cause her bike to flip end over end. Not what she wanted to have happen with a whole class of 15 aggressive racers behind her. Purple Shirt gave the space, then pushed back. Dusty jerked to avoid smacking his foot peg. Her bike caught, her handlebars twisted. She jerked them back, keeping the throttle on wide open. Sweat trickled down her forehead. The visor on her helmet steamed up, fogging her vision. She could see the horizon where blue met brown, but couldn't judge the distance to the first jump. Fifty feet? Thirty? She needed to get out of the middle. Pushing again at purple shirt, she refused to allow anything but cool determination to sit in her chest. She'd done this a thousand times before but Purple Shirt either didn't see her or was determined to keep her boxed in. The latter was quite possible, since she was the current points leader and, hence, the person to beat. Her bike screamed beneath her. She twisted hard on the throttle, keeping it wide open. She wanted to catch a big lift on that jump, but not from the middle. Changing up, she pushed against Yellow Shirt on her right but Red Shirt ran tire to tire with him, and he couldn't give her the space if he wanted to. She tried Purple Shirt again, still no budging. In a split second, her three options ran through her brain. Force Purple Shirt to move, with contact if necessary, risking a crash for both of them. Slow down, let him and Red and Yellow go by, which was surely the plan of the other three leaders or shift her weight off her front tire and hit the jump flat in the middle. The third option would have been the only one she would have considered, except she couldn't see. She hadn't expected it to be this hot, and she hadn't put her anti-fog on her visor. Rookie mistake. A decision had to be made, fast. Pushing once more at Purple Shirt, who didn't budge from her side, she crouched on her pegs and squinted, wanting to get the timing just right. Pulling up would slow her down. Not much, but enough to let the others get ahead. Where she wanted to be. Where she was going to be. Nothing was going to stop her from becoming the first female motocross champion. Suddenly, the jump loomed up in front of her, faster than she had estimated. She stood and leaned back but she was a millisecond too late. Her front tire dipped. Her body hitched forward. Her bike kicked up, and she was flung over the handlebars, 
spread eagle in the air. Purple Shirt had decided at the last minute to move over, giving way to a guy in a blue shirt. She caught it out of the corner of her eye in the split second she hung upside down and backward in the air. The split second before he crashed into her. A crack sounded loud in her ears. Pain flared up her back and out both arms. Her body flung wildly. She saw the next bike coming and tried to twist, but the pain radiated out in sharp spikes and her mind went black. Four weeks later. This one's yours. Sherry, the office nurse, handed Roland Bryant a folder with a smirk. The harsh fluorescent lighting in their physical therapy office glanced off the pristine white walls with tasteful overblown photos of palm trees hung in an even spread. He took the folder as he stood behind the high counter and opened it. Sherry put one hand on the counter. Her bright red nails sparkled. They requested the best. She laughed. <laughs> you know what that means. With a lifting of her brows, she walked away. Roland swallowed his snort. When a client requested the best, it was almost always because they were the worst. Not the worst as in the physical worst, but the worst as in the most difficult to deal with. He always got those. His eyes skimmed over the folder. The client would be waiting in the big room where all the therapy sessions were held, but he always liked a little privacy to familiarize himself with a new patient's background before he met them. Some injuries were so horrific he couldn't contain his grimace. Some were unusual, requiring him to do a quick search or even shoot off a few emails to colleagues for their advice and opinion on best practices. Dusty Gibson, 26. He'd fractured his femur and vertebrae T11 and T12 in a motocross race. Roland shuddered. There was a starred note that he was a top contender and insisted that he would race again. Maybe Roland was the best, but he wasn't a miracle worker, and Dusty was flipping lucky he wasn't paralyzed. Yeah, he closed the folder, already picturing in his head exercises that would strengthen the rarely used muscles in the back that would help Dusty until his leg was fully healed. Normally, Roland worked the best with the patients who were discouraged, who needed someone with a story of their own to breathe hope back into a client who wondered what their life was going to consist of now that they were no longer perfectly whole. That, Roland could do. He just told his own story, leaving his dead fiance out of it. With a last glance to make sure all the proper forms had been signed, he carried the folder out. He glanced inconspicuously around the room. Dusty wouldn't be the older gentleman, nor the three senior ladies scattered through the room. A skinny elementary school-aged boy sat beside a woman, his mother presumably, with his arm in a brace and his ball cap pulled down over his forehead. Roland's eyes skimmed over all of those. Dusty would have a leg brace. He might even be in a wheelchair. Only two people in the patient waiting corner of the large room could possibly be 28 years old. A man who did not have a leg cast, and a slim woman with waist-length blonde hair who did. She also wore a back brace. Dusty Gibson, motocross champion, was a woman. Roland dealt with men, women, boys, girls, old men, and senior ladies so the odd reaction of his heart, which twisted in his chest, was unexpected and unwelcome. He put his game face on. Dusty Gibson. The blonde rose stiffly, which is the only way one could move in a back brace. She turned. Roland's heart twisted again, harder. Her wide blue eyes turned in his direction, looking for a source of the summons. 
A heart-shaped face, cute nose, and high cheekbones complemented that long, straight hair. Her carriage was proud, and despite the braces, she moved with a cat-like grace. No wheelchair. She wasn't even using crutches. He obviously hadn't studied her chart in enough depth. He pointed to the first counseling room along the side. We're going in there. Let me grab your chart. It wasn't the way he normally met patients, but Dusty had already turned his normal upside down, and he hadn't even introduced himself yet. In the course of his practice as a physical therapist, he'd had a few patients that had stuck with him because of the severity of their injuries, their amazing personalities, or their grit and determination. He knew for sure Dusty was going to be one of those patients he didn't forget. Grabbing her chart, he caught up to her in time to open the counseling room door for her. She gave him a disdainful look. I can get it myself. I'm sure you can. Don't patronize me. She wasn't the first person who came in for therapy with a bad attitude. Now wasn't the time for tough love. That would come soon enough. I'm sorry, he said. She walked through the door without another word. He followed, closing it behind him. Chapter 2 Dusty wanted to fling herself down in the light blue plastic seat, but her back and leg both still hurt, and she wasn't going to fling herself anywhere for a while. So she sat, gingerly, hating the fact that her once agile and strong body was crippled and painful. It wasn't the therapist's fault, though. I'm sorry I snapped at you, she said grudgingly as the man dressed in khaki pants and a blue polo with the logo of the therapy place in white letters on his shirt stopped in front of her. It's okay. I know this isn't where you want to be. She snorted. <laughs> Not even close. So that's my job, to get you better so you don't have to come here anymore. The guy was affable and not bad looking. She gave him a half smile. Let's get started. I think that's my line. You gotta be fast if you wanna beat me. Let's start at the beginning then. He held out his hand. I'm Roland, and I'm going to be coordinating your therapy for the next six months or so. She smirked, grabbing his proffered hand. I'm Dusty, and I'm going to do one month, maybe six weeks of this crap, then I'm going back on the circuit. She met his eyes while she spoke, deep and solid green. They seemed to be searching straight into her soul. Something about his expression, his firm, warm handshake, his confident bearing. She wasn't sure what it was, but she trusted him immediately, which was unusual for her. Usually, people had to prove themselves to her. He blinked, pulling his hand away. Instead of walking around and sitting on the other side of the desk that took up most of the small room, he perched on the corner of it, on her side. Are you comfortable in that chair? He asked. Not really. He jerked his head at the chair behind the desk. Sit there. It'll be a lot easier on your back and leg. She didn't appreciate the command given without even a modification in the way of a please. But in her current state, it was hard to get comfortable, and she'd take what she could get. Thank you, she said, standing carefully. He made no move to help her. Not that she could blame him after she about snapped his head off when he opened the door for her. She gimped around and sat in the big, comfortable office chair. There's a stool there to prop your leg on. She looked down, and sure enough, a small wooden stool poked out from under the desk. Thanks. His head was bent over her chart. You're welcome, he said without lifting his head. She could tell him what was in the chart. 
that she'd fractured two vertebrae and her femur, torn ligaments in her knee and right shoulder, bruised five ribs, was lucky to be walking. Whatever, the season was going on without her, and she wanted to get back out. She had been so close to being the first woman to ever win the big championship. She hated feeling that slip through her fingers. Technically, so far, she'd only missed three points races. Even though she hadn't raced, she was still fifth in the standings. She could still pull off a win. And how much sweeter would it be winning after coming back from such a massive setback? The seconds ticked away. Dusty resisted the urge to squirm. She wasn't used to sitting still this long. When he finally looked up, he didn't ask any of the questions she'd been expecting. Where's your ride? She rolled her eyes. It was written right in her chart that she wasn't allowed to drive. My friend dropped me off. She had some errands to run and a baby and toddler that will fare much better at the park down the road than in the waiting room here. I'd like to meet her when she picks you up. She glared at him. That's your way of making sure I didn't ride my Harley here? His eyebrows lifted a fraction. Ha. I hadn't considered that you might ride your Harley to your first outpatient physical therapy session after breaking your back, your femur, bruising your ribs, and ripping ligaments in your knee and shoulder. He tilted his head. My bad. She snorted, trying to keep her lips from quirking up. It's easy to underestimate me. I'll keep that in mind. He tapped the chart. I see you just got permission today to walk on that leg. It's only been four weeks. Did you have the doctor in a headlock when he wrote that? She pursed her lips. No. She waited a beat. I had him pinned on the floor with his arm twisted back and up around his ear. Crossing her arms over her chest, she waited. He nodded like she'd told him the truth. Another thing to keep in mind. Her eyes ran over his torso and noted how his biceps strained against the sleeves of his polo shirt. She wasn't going to manhandle him. Not that she was used to winning in physical contests. Soaking wet, she might weigh 110 pounds. No, if she wanted to beat the boys, she had to do it on her bike. And right now, she needed this guy to help her. Listen, the doc at my appointment today didn't really want me walking without the crutches. But my femur wasn't a compound fracture. It was just a crack. And the x-rays clearly showed that a good solid bit of bone is formed over the split. The best thing I can do for it is to start using it regularly. His lips thinned, but he didn't argue with her. She appreciated that quality in a man. Well, you definitely surprised me when you're only four weeks out and don't have crutches. He crossed his arms over his chest. His shirt stretched tight. Dusty kept her eyes pointed up at his face. A wheelchair wouldn't have surprised me. He wiggled the folder that was under his arm. I definitely knew I needed to go back and read your chart in detail. His jaw stuck out. Some clients I have to motivate to move, and some I have to hold back. I know what category you belong to. Me too, and you're not holding me back. There's a big race in six weeks, and I'm planning on being in it. His mouth tightened and his eyes slid away. But again, he didn't argue. Good. You've got to understand, Dusty, that doing too much can be just as detrimental as not doing enough. I'm on board to get you up and moving like you're used to, without pain, as fast as we can. I'll work with you as hard as I can. But in return, You've got to promise me that you're not going to jeopardize our progress by pushing farther than I say you can. He raised his brow. She dropped her eyes. Everything in her was on go fast. 
She didn't really have another speed. But again, that feeling that she could trust him sat like a comforting hand on her shoulder. Dusty, you broke your back. You're very lucky we're talking about getting back normal motion instead of me teaching you how to empty your catheter bag. She jerked her head. It didn't happen, and we're not talking about it. I think you can regain full motor function, and I think you can live pain-free for the most part. But only if you do this right. You've got great reports from your surgeries and from the hospital therapists. Let's do this thing right, Dusty. She found herself nodding before she even realized it. Okay, I'll do what you say. That's the attitude. He stood. Let's go out and get started. She struggled to her feet. I'm going to show you some exercises you can do at home. You're going to be in here every day for a few weeks, but you can still practice at home. In the afternoon, if your appointment is in the morning, or in the morning if you're seeing me in the afternoon. Always you. He opened the door and held it for her. I get the tough cases. She smirked then looked pointedly at his hand on the door. Thank you. He smiled, showing a strong jaw and straight white teeth. You're welcome. He'd definitely been right that Dusty was going to challenge him, constantly pushing to do more, even when he could see the lines of pain tightening her eyes and mouth. It was funny. Some patients he had to practically whip to get them to do what needed to be done. With Dusty, he needed a bridle and a set of reins to pull back on with all his might. And even then, he wasn't sure he could slow her down. You can do this one on a step, he said, leading her to the small, sturdy stair they used that was free. Other therapists with other clients were working all around, but he was used to it and it didn't bother him. Dusty was single-mindedly focused on doing every exercise correctly and for as long as she could. He wasn't even sure half the time she remembered he was around. She had her game face on now as she watched him demonstrate. This will help strengthen the ligaments that the surgeon repaired in your knee. He'd already learned that if he told her 10 reps, she did 15. So he instructed her to do two-thirds as many as he wanted, hiding his satisfied smile when she did exactly what he expected and did almost the exact number he wanted her to do to begin with. Their entire session went like that. Somehow the hour flew by. He was showing her the last exercise when Dusty got a big smile on her face and waved. He blinked. Dusty wearing a full-on smile was gorgeous. Shoving that unprofessional thought clear out of his head, he looked over at the door. A woman with two toddlers, one with tight curly hair as black as night and one with hair as red as her mother's. The woman waved back. Do you need to tell her you'll be a minute? No. Dusty imitated the position he'd shown her and did the exercise perfectly. A couple of minutes later, she straightened. Give me a minute, and I'll get you a sheet printed with all the exercise you'll need to do this evening or tonight. He paused and waited until Dusty met his eyes. Don't overdo it. She smiled sweetly. I won't. He wasn't fooled by that sweet smile. He narrowed his eyes. Did you take your prescription pain pills? Her smile disappeared. No, and I won't. I'll deal with the pain. I can't risk getting addicted. He shook his head. At least take some over-the-counter stuff. You can take two different kinds as long as they don't have the same active ingredient. He tilted his head and gave his most charming smile. This will be a lot easier on you if you take the edge off at least. Her lips pulled back, but her smile did not reach her eyes. I'll consider it. It was probably the best he was going to get from her. 
I'll be back in a minute with your printout. Okay. She turned and gimped to her friend. He went over to his laptop and typed up the session notes. Then he grabbed the exercises she needed and printed them out. Putting them in a folder, he walked over to Dusty and the red-haired woman. Roland, this is Harris Baxter. Harris, this is my torturer, Roland. Apparently, he's the best they have here. Roland's brows went up with that introduction, but he shook Harris's hand. Nice to meet you, ma'am. It's good to meet you, too. Harris was soft-spoken, and Roland wondered how someone like Dusty could have a friend like Harris. They seemed to be opposites. I'm supposed to ask you how long until Dusty can ride her Harley to therapy. Dusty and I already had a whole conversation about her Harley. And you neglected to mention when I could start riding it. Dusty crossed her arms over her chest. He held her eyes. No one had apparently told her what it said in big, bold letters at the bottom of her file, although someone should have. Maybe she was in denial? Or maybe she didn't realize he knew? Not this week. Let's leave it at that and go from there next week, okay? Her lips flattened, but she said, Okay. With a little girl's hand in each one of her own, she hobbled slowly out the door. He watched her go, her long, blonde ponytail swinging below her waist. Obviously, there was something in her past driving her. He felt a kindred spirit in that regard. But one of the first lessons he'd learned was not to get too attached to his patients. His job was to fix them and let them go. Dusty would be devastated when she learned what her chart said, if she didn't already know. But he wasn't going to tell her. Her doctor should have already done that. But if he didn't, Roland wasn't going to push in. Not only might it demoralize her, but it was possible she could give up altogether. Let her strive for the goal and let her doctor deliver the bad news. Chapter 3 Dusty sat on the park bench with her friend, Cassidy Baxter, and watched the sun come up. The western sky glowed a pretty pink and blue, while the eastern sky exploded in glorious orange color that reflected off a long, thin layer of clouds. The shallow reservoir in front of her glowed in muted reflection, and orange shone off the shiny plastic monkey bars and the silver slide. Before her accident, when her schedule allowed, she and Cassidy had made a point to meet in the early morning and walk together. Their town wasn't huge, and the park wasn't terribly busy, but it was a popular place for joggers and walkers in the morning. I'm sorry you're missing your exercise time. Cassidy shrugged like it didn't matter. Don't worry about it. Dusty didn't have children, but her best friends were all married with small kids, and she knew that even a few minutes to take a short walk was precious with the little ones around. Cassidy put a hand on Dusty's shoulder. I have the rest of my life to walk. When I first heard about your accident, I thought I would be spending the rest of my life walking alone. She tilted her head, doing the parent thing with her eyebrows, trying to make Dusty feel guilty for making her worry. It worked. Torque enjoys spending mornings with the kids, and he likes knowing that I'm spending time with a friend. So don't apologize. Give me a couple of weeks, and we'll be back walking. The park road which they walked on made a big half-mile loop around the trees and creek and playground and scattered pavilions and reservoir. With the help of your handsome therapist? Cassidy bumped her shoulders but kept her eyes on the sunrise. Yep. Dusty didn't take the bait. With his help and the help of my doctors and surgeons and my friends. She didn't mention her parents. They were in their big motorhome, heading back from Arizona. 
Her mother had flown in right after her accident, but she'd left after a week or two. Dusty was there late in life, oops. With two brothers who were almost 20 years older than she was, she grew up pretty much alone, always knowing that she was the only thing keeping her parents from enjoying their empty nest. Harris said the guy was pretty good looking. Does Turbo know she's looking at other men? Dusty asked lightly. Turbo adored his wife. The adoration was mutual and sometimes annoying for their friend who wasn't married. Harris is a natural-born matchmaker. She found a new skill? Dusty couldn't remember anyone Harris had actually helped get together. Now, Turbo's brother Tough, on the other hand, maybe he wasn't exactly a matchmaker, but since he wrote a syndicated romance advice column, he was definitely knowledgeable about relationships even if he didn't talk much. Cassidy shrugged. You're changing the subject. Is your therapist good looking? In a not for me because he's too soft kind of way. A little line of guilt shot down her sore back, but Dusty ignored it. Roland was gorgeous, and he definitely wasn't soft. Hmm, what does that mean? Harris said he looked like he could throw you over his shoulder and haul you away if he wanted to. Yeah, any seventh grader could do that. Dusty rolled her eyes. She'd been skinny and straight as a beanpole her whole life. Not that it bothered her. When she had her helmet on, everyone thought she was a young boy. Which was fine. She didn't want any special treatment just because she was female. Especially on the track. Cassidy chuckled. Okay, fine. Don't tell your best friend about your cute, unmarried therapist. I never asked him if he was married. Dusty's eyes widened, and she kept her head turned to the sunrise that was fading from the sky so Cassidy wouldn't know. Harris said he wasn't wearing a ring. You know, I don't care what the doctors say. I'm driving myself to my next therapy session. Harris spent more time checking the guy out than I did. So you did check him out? Busted. Cassidy made a great lawyer. He's cute, she shrugged. Okay, I admit it. The guy is cute, and he's nice, and he seems knowledgeable about what he's doing. I specifically demanded that my doctor request the best, and he's what they gave me. But come on, he's a professional, and right now, I'm hardly attractive with these bulky braces. Cassidy flipped Dusty's ponytail. This blonde hair is striking wherever you are. It was her only feminine attribute. She didn't have hips, and she didn't have boobs. She didn't have time for makeup, even if she knew how to put it on, and she hated shopping, so her wardrobe was simple and functional. But she did make time for her hair. I don't want a guy who falls in love with long blonde hair. There's a lot more to me than my hair. But your hair would catch his eye, make him look twice, and maybe he'd notice all the realness beneath the hair. I want to win the championship. I'm not really interested in cute guys. Cassidy didn't say anything, and Dusty appreciated it. Most guys couldn't take her competitive streak, and that was fine with her. Maybe it had to do with her parents never seeming to want her, but none of the superficial boyfriends she'd had ever seemed to really want her for herself. Maybe she was a self-fulfilling prophecy. She and Harris and Cassidy and their other friend, Kelly, had more than one discussion about Dusty's inability to trust a guy when he said he'd stay. Well, Harris seemed impressed with this one. I want to meet him. He wears polo shirts, and his hands don't have calluses on them. I could ride circles around him on my bike. He's not for me. She was such a liar. 
Of course, it was true that she had never been attracted to the Yale-type, white-collar professional man look. But Roland rocked it. And his compassionate personality, essential for his job, pulled at her. There's some kind of rule somewhere that says you can't have a relationship with your therapist anyway. I think that's your shrink. Dusty laughed. Quit it. You know it's true. Just like you couldn't have a relationship with your client. Probably not with a judge, either. You're probably right, but I don't have to worry about that since Torque has no plans to give up his garage and put on a black robe. Cassidy tilted her head. Although, he'd look good in one. Dusty snorted her eye caught by a figure jogging on the other side of the reservoir. It wasn't really that he looked familiar, but it was more that he wore jogging pants rather than shorts like the other joggers. They'd seen him before from a distance as they walked, but it had been cooler. Now that it was June and the weather had warmed, it seemed odd that he was still dressed like it was early spring. One of my associates at the courthouse wants to learn to fly. Cassidy's words made Dusty jerk her eyes away from the jogger. Something about him nagged her. Cassidy continued. You took lessons for a while, didn't you? I have. Motocross has taken most of my time, but I'd love to get back to it. She loved flying, but her competitive nature had gotten sucked into the efforts to win a championship. She'd have to make time to get back in the air. Was your instructor good? I told my associate I'd ask you for a recommendation. He thinks he'll have to go to Pittsburgh for a good flight instructor. No, I took lessons from Whiff at the regional airport outside of town, and he was really great. I loved him, very calm and knowledgeable. Dusty took her eyes off the jogger to dig her phone out of her pocket. I'm sure I still have his contact. She punched it up and shot off a text with the info to Cassidy. There, you should have it now. I highly recommend him. Thanks. Dusty's eyes went back to the jogger. What was it about him? Then his head turned, glancing at the sunrise, and the angle of his jaw tripped the memory in her brain. That's him. Huh? Cassidy said her gaze on the sky where only a bit of orange still glowed against the blue. I think that's my therapist. Cassidy's eyes snapped to Dusty before going to the man across the water. The jogger? Cassidy asked, even though he was the only man in sight. Yep. That guy jogs here almost every day. We've seen him a lot before. You didn't recognize him? Cassidy asked. No, I never pay attention. That's true. We're usually talking so much, I just throw a hand up to wave and never really look at the people we pass. Cassidy stared thoughtfully. It's hard to see from here, but he looks built. He's not a slacker if he's up this early. The jogger turned his head back, but then, for some reason, maybe he felt their eyes on him, he looked out over the water. Dusty jerked, like his gaze had shocked through her. He couldn't recognize her from over there, she thought, just as he raised his hand in a wave. She returned his greeting. Had he recognized her? You recognized him, Cassidy said, and Dusty realized she'd asked that question out loud. It was probably the hair. It's usually behind your back, but today it's hanging down in front. Hard to miss. Dusty fingered her hair as the jogger disappeared into the woods. Come on, let's go get some coffee before we head home. Dusty lifted herself slowly off the bench, appreciating the fact that Cassidy didn't try to help. You know, just because the guy doesn't have a death wish like you doesn't mean he wouldn't make a great husband and father. And you can give me your tough girl attitude all you want, but that's what you want. 
a guy who's going to stick with you. Don't dismiss him because he doesn't come from the world you rotate in. Dusty compressed her lips and didn't answer as she limped down the path toward Cassidy's car. Cassidy politely didn't point out that Dusty came from wealth and privilege. She wasn't born with a wrench in her hand. It was what she wanted, an easy way to get attention, maybe, and her parents had indulged her. It really didn't matter. She wasn't giving it up, and she couldn't see a guy like Roland in the stands at one of her races. He'd stand out like a blue pumpkin in a field of orange. Chapter 4 Roland checked the time. Dusty should be coming in any second. He knew the schedule, and he knew which clients were on it. So just because he knew Dusty should be walking through that door did not mean he was interested in her for anything more than the client-patient relationship. But he had thought about her. He wasn't sure if the woman in the park this morning was her or not. But the blonde hair stood out, even across the water in the early morning light. Maybe he just wanted it to be her. He'd spent the hours since he'd seen her lecturing himself on how he needed to be professional. Keep that distance between them. Do the job he'd been hired to do. The one he was good at. Sherry waved him over. He checked again for Dusty before walking to her desk. She pressed a button on her office phone, probably mute, before she spoke, low and excited. Remember those two mountain bikers you worked with last summer? Roland nodded. They were professors at a college in Florida, but had come to Pennsylvania and rented a house because they wanted to bike in the Appalachians. They hadn't been injured, but they'd gone to him for strength training exercises to avoid injury. Nice guys. They'd loved his work and had taken him out for dinner the last night before they went back to Florida. They still called once in a while. I have a ski instructor on the phone who says they recommended you to him. He wants you to go out to Colorado and spend three to four weeks working with his clients. Sherry lowered her voice even further. High-end clients. Like he didn't know it, she added. This would be great for our practice. Craig wants to expand. But Roland was already shaking his head. If they come in here, I'll work with them as much as they want. I'm not flying out. He wasn't flying. Full stop. I know your position, Sherry said. And I already told him. They can't fly in. She gave him a prodding look. This would be fabulous for your career. No. He said it firmly and clearly. He was not flying. Not ever again. He'd barely survived the last time. Janice didn't. Sherry's face fell, but she nodded. His attitude about flying was not a secret. He didn't care how much it hurt his career. He walked away, looking around for Dusty, putting the opportunity he was missing out of his head. It wasn't worth it. Dusty walked in alone again. He smiled a little to himself, wondering if her Harley was parked in the lot, but fairly sure it wasn't. She was a risk taker and a little untamed, which was hugely attractive to him, kind of like his former fiance, but she wasn't stupid. Pain squeezed his heart. He hadn't thought of Janice in a while, but he'd never recover from losing her. Some things just couldn't be erased out of a human brain. The screams of his loved one as she lay trapped and burning to death were one of those things. Maybe he was attracted to Dusty's untamed nature, but it repulsed him at the same time. He could never put himself in a relationship again where he was constantly worried about his partner. He'd been to enough funerals. He'd also seen enough in his job about what happened to the risk takers. They ended up in the waiting room, 
wanting him to get them moving again so they could go right back out and do whatever dangerous thing had landed them there to begin with. No thanks. Dusty Gibson, he called. She stopped walking toward the waiting area chairs and turned, her eyes finding him. He gave his best professional smile. Come on, let's get started. Normally, he worked with several clients at once, but often with the first few sessions of therapy, he started clients one-on-one, -on -one, especially the more challenging cases. Dusty definitely belonged in that category. She limped over. The big brace on her leg was uncomfortable and bulky. It was enough to frustrate most people. But then she had the back brace on as well. She had to feel claustrophobic and all that. How'd your exercises go? Fine. Sore? A little. She seemed a little depressed. He was supposed to note in the file if the client's mental health seemed off. He'd give her a few minutes. There had been a few patients over the years who had just never warmed up to him for whatever reason. Maybe Dusty would be one of them. You didn't ride your Harley in, did you? A little smile ghosted her lips. <laughs> nope. That's good. I'd hate to have to note that in your chart. I didn't drive either. She pushed her ponytail over her shoulder. That's good to know. Although a car would be preferable to the bike, either one would be a real challenge with that brace. Let's get started. He put her through the exercises he'd given her and taught her a few that he'd looked up online. She did them with the same concentration and determination that she'd shown the previous day. Toward the end of the session, she still wasn't smiling. You seem down. Are you in pain? He didn't want to have to make a note and have her hauled off to a therapist if she didn't need it. No, I'm fine. He crossed his arms and looked at her. You would tell me if this is too much for you? Probably not, she answered. He liked that honesty. When she didn't say any more, he considered taking her into the consulting room and telling her his story. It was part of his job. Usually it helped clients to know that he understood exactly what they were going through. It was an encouragement especially to the ones that weren't motivated or were depressed. Dusty didn't have a problem with lack of motivation. For some reason, he didn't want to show his vulnerability to Dusty. Deciding she wasn't depressed and didn't need his life story, he finished their session without prying further. He'd wait and see how she was the next day. A different friend came to pick her up, bubbly and blonde, she had three small children with her. Did all of Dusty's friends have families? And where were her parents? Even middle-aged people usually had their parents around. He chided himself. It was only her second day. But there was the red-haired friend from yesterday, the brown-haired friend on the park bench, if that was even Dusty, and now a blonde. At least she had variety in her friend's hair color. Roland, this is Kelly. Dusty introduced him when he came over with her instruction paper. Then he realized where he'd seen her before. You're Tough Baxter's wife. Tough Baxter was his mechanic, which reminded him he needed to schedule an oil change. She nodded with a big smile. Sure am. Grabbing his hand, she pumped it. You've also donated some time to work with the kids at the children's centers I run. He studied her, thinking. I don't remember seeing you there. The different therapists usually donated a month of after-work time. He always made sure his month was in the winter, usually January. It was a very unofficial thing. But kids could always benefit from learning exercises that would straighten their posture or help prevent carpal tunnel. He'd show them stretches and explain the benefits of staying flexible. Then there were always those few children who could use more specialized care. 
He did his best and enjoyed working with the children, giving them tools they could use for the rest of their lives. No, I typically arrange things, secure funding, sometimes drop in and watch to make sure everything is going okay. I even pick kids up and drop them off. But I don't get involved in things I don't know anything about, like physical therapy. He nodded, aware that Dusty was watching him. He turned to her, while Kelly's children tugged at her hands. Here's your printout. Same drill as yesterday. Do these this afternoon or this evening, and I'll see you again tomorrow. Yes, sir. She didn't salute, but allowed the kids tugging at her hands to drag her out the door. By the end of her first two weeks of outpatient therapy, Dusty was ready to quit. It felt like she wasn't getting anywhere. She walked in after Cassidy dropped her off even more dejected than usual. She was putting her friends out, getting rides every day. Riley, Ben Baxter's wife, was going to use her lunch break to pick her up, which made Dusty feel awful. Even though Riley had only been in the area a little over a year, Dusty loved her like a sister. Still, it was bad enough to put her lifelong friends out. Even worse was taking advantage of her good friends, too. By the time this was over, people weren't going to be answering the phone when she called. Dusty Gibson, bring your smile over here. She rolled her eyes, and yes, her lips turned up at Roland's cheesy call. When she got close enough to him, she said, Do people ever ignore you because you're so embarrassing? Nope. He stopped. Well, not that I know of. Sometimes I just assume people aren't here. She laughed, probably as he intended. More than being concerned with just her physical well-being, he seemed to keep a finger on the pulse of her emotions, too. It should bother her, because it was none of his business. But her brain had decided to trust him the first time she was here, and it hadn't changed its mind. They went through her exercises easily and finished early. If you don't mind, I'd like to spend a few minutes in the consulting room. She shrugged. Did it really matter if she minded? She followed him to the middle room, not even taking the bait when he smirked and opened the door for her. She breezed through. No, in her mind, she breezed through. In reality, she limped painfully and slowly through the door, moving around the desk to sit in the comfortable chair on the other side. He didn't even bother to hide his grin. She propped her leg up. What? Were you going to make the poor crippled girl sit in the uncomfortable chair? He shook his head slowly, his grin fading. They ought to get better chairs in here. Like every time before, he leaned on the edge of the desk. Tell me what the trouble is. I can't fix what I don't know is broken. Straight to the point, she could respect that. She leaned forward, clasping her hands and twitching at the pain in her back and leg. Fine, she shrugged. It's not helping. It's been six weeks since my accident, three weeks since my surgeries. I'm still in pain, and I'm sick of bumming rides from my friends. Almost as sick as they must be of giving them. I want to see results. She looked up and met his clear green eyes. I've been doing every single thing you said, and I've been doing it faithfully. I haven't shirked or skipped. I fought through the pain, and frankly, it's depressing to not see any improvement. We measured your range of motion in your knee. It's improved 15% just in this week. I want to lose the brace. Only the doctor can do that for you. You have an appointment Monday, right? She wasn't Roland's only patient. How did he keep these facts in his head? Maybe because he'd just studied her chart before she came in. He hadn't looked at it since, 
although it was tucked under his arm as he sat on the corner of the desk with his arms crossed. That's right. I can make a note on your chart that you've been excelling with your exercises and following your instructions to the letter. I've already written down your improved range of motion. You still have pain, but am I wrong in calculating that it's not as bad? She thought back. He was right. Those back-strengthening exercises have helped. They're designed to train the muscles that support your spine. It takes some of the pressure off and helps with the pain. It has, I guess. She looked down. Is that what's really bothering you? For some reason, his question brought tears to her eyes. She kept her eyes down on her lap where she picked at her fingers. She sighed, blinking back the annoying weakness of tears. There was a race today. I should be checked in and doing my practice laps. Instead, I'm stuck here, barely able to move and dependent on my friends to haul me around. Roland didn't move and he didn't say anything. She appreciated the time to get her features composed. Finally, she looked up. I'm sorry my bad attitude was so awful that you noticed. I was just a little down about the race, but I'm still committed to pounding out these exercises and getting better. He nodded, his brows drawn together. I really don't think your friends mind taking you around. They love you and appreciate the opportunity to do something for you. Isn't that how you'd feel if your positions were reversed? Guilt made her bow her head again. It is. I'm the one that resents my loss of freedom. I wish I could make this process easier or faster, but in order to do it right, it has to be like this. She put her hand up. I know. That's why I've tried not to complain. But you asked. He grunted a laugh. <laughs> That's true, I did. She lifted her head up. You just don't understand what it's like. Hi, this is Jay, and thanks for listening. If you're ready for another great audiobook, here's one we think you might like. Or check out the playlist with all our latest releases. Don't forget to subscribe to Say With Jay, give this video a thumbs up, and tell us what you liked in the comments.